Political Science Association and like to officially welcome you to Long Beach, California for the 10th Annual uh, 2013 American Political Science Association Teaching and Learning Conference. So we're so glad to see all of you here. We're very excited that this is the 10th year. We've seen lots of growth over these 10 years and we're happy to say that we also have a number of individuals who have been with have been with us since the very beginning of the conference, since the very origins of the conference. And uh, Michael Brittenall is our Executive Director of the American Political Science Association. He's standing in the back. We'll hear from him tomorrow. He'll... Hi, Michael. <laughs> Michael will be offering the, the Pi Sigma Alpha keynote address uh, tomorrow afternoon. But he's also given me a few notes that he usually likes to present during this opening session. So I'm here to kind of present a few notes on who we are this year at the meeting. Um, as I stated earlier, this is the 10th anniversary of the Teaching and Learning Conference. The first meeting was held in 2004, and I'm told that it was kind of by invitation only, you know, kind of a very small working group. Um, and then in 2005, that was the first meeting where we actually extended an official call for participants and a call for papers, and I'm also told by Michael, um, and I keep saying that because I don't want to be wrong, and if I'm wrong, then you can talk to Michael. <laughs> um, that uh, since 2005, we've had, I believe, five individuals who have attended all nine conferences. So I'm going to list their names, and if they're here, we'd like for them to stand up. And if I don't mention your name and you think you've been here for nine consecutive teaching and learning conferences, or ten, please also stand up. So uh, Mary McHugh. Johnny Shiyama, Frank Franz, John Williams, and Kirsten Hahnen. So let's give them a hand. Congratulations. Did I miss anyone? Does anyone think they've been to all 10 or 9 and I didn't mention your name? Okay, so the next group would be people who have been to 8 meetings, um, and that would be <laughs> Allison McCartney, Michelle Deardorff, Candace Young, and Mitchell Brown. Would you guys stand so we can acknowledge you? Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And we will be hearing more about the origins of the Teaching and Learning Conference at the uh, roundtable um, in about half an hour. Also, um, what we usually do is kind of list, again, who we are at the meeting. Um, and we understand that in, just in terms of the type of institutions that you guys come from, we know that of, um, of the individuals who listed what their institution is, we have 67 individuals who hail from PhD granting institutions, 66 hail from BA, um, political science BA granting institutions, 19 come from um, a BA combined um, uh, department, five from a social science department, 44 from master's granting institutions, 38 from community colleges, and then there are 54 that we don't know. So if you think you're one of those people um, that didn't identify yourself and you're slipping under the radar, we know about you and we want to know more about you, so come tell us who you are. Um, also, we're a very international conference. We are very pleased to welcome, again, a very uh, large contingency from the UK. I'm, I'm told that there are probably 10 scholars from the UK, so if you wouldn't mind standing so we know who you are, that would be wonderful. Let's see if there's 10. I see one, two, three, four. Great. Thank you. And again, I'm told by Michael that we have scholars from the following countries. Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Korea, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Slovenia. So again, we welcome all of you. This is an international conference. We are an international association with scholars, both uh, domestic as well as around the world. So we thank you. And again, that kind of shows uh, the reach of the American Political Science Association and the importance of teaching and learning globally. Um, so over the past year, the Teaching and Learning Program Committee has done a great deal of work in planning for this particular meeting, the programming committee is chaired by Candice Young. Candice in the front here. So we thank you for that. Um, we also would like to thank Michael Brittenall for his support um, 
for the conference over the last years, and also um, to the APSA staff who's helped out. They're around, and they'll be helping you um, during uh, the weekend kind of navigate the conference. So if you have any questions, feel free to go to the registration area or just stop one of us and ask us questions. Speaking of questions, they should all be, if you can't have them answered in person and you're kind of on the fly, your program should also help you to answer any questions. So I just want to make an announcement that some tracks will be meeting in different rooms throughout the meeting. So if you are mindful, you should make sure you take a look at page four and five and make sure that your track is meeting where you think it is. The rooms are listed by each session and also on the daily schedule. So it could be that you're starting out in Naples room number one, but later on tomorrow you may be in Raphael. So just be mindful of that. I'm sure your moderator will also make note of that as well. Um, we are joined today by over 300 attendees, and um, we're quite pleased about that. Additionally, we will be broadcasting this session live, which we, we do each year. So currently, we're um, live streaming with the help of Derek Cogburn's team from Cotelco at American University. So let's give them a hand. <clears throat> So this gives us an opportunity to allow individuals who weren't able to come to the meeting or whose uh, schedules you know, did not al allow them to be here to also participate in the meeting. So you may be in a track that has a camera and a very fancy looking microphone. So that's basically the live streaming feed. We'll also make that, um, street, that stream available online as a recording so that when you go back to your departments, you can share this experience with your colleagues. Also, this year's remote participation is actually a part of the virtual brown bag series. This is a new series that we have at the American Political Science Association <clears throat> to promote professional development. So we're actually encouraging scholars to kind of tune in as well to the proceedings here as a way of developing skills and gaining additional resources in terms of their teaching and learning. So we do value um, the work that's gone on here and the scholarship, the teaching and learning as well. The program committee selected for this year um, as their theme, teaching political science, preparing students for success. And one person who knows a great deal about this and a great deal about teaching and preparing students for success is APSA President Jane Mansbridge. And so I just would like to introduce her very briefly as she will join us to offer her opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Mansbridge is the Charles F. Adams Professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Her research lies at the intersection between democratic theory and empirical social science, with a focus on political inequalities and the democratic processes that can counteract those inequalities. Her first book, Beyond Adversary Democracy, Study Deliberation and Inequality in Two Small uh, Direct uh, Democracies. Professor Mansbridge was the program chair of, of APSA in 1992 during the presidency of, of Judith Sklar. She's also served as the Vice President and a member of the AFSA Council as well as the exec Executive Committee. Uh, she currently serves on the editorial boards for Political Theory, the Journal of Political Philosophy, and the Journal of Politics, among others. So if you would please join me in welcoming Dr. Mansbridge. Thank you, Kim. Welcome, everybody. Can, can everyone hear me with my voice? Okay, great. Oh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm happy to reaffirm APSA's strong, strong commitment to teaching and learning. Um, and I'm just getting to know this, com uh, this whole community and actually getting more and more excited with every word I hear people say and, and every interaction I have. It, it seems to be a really vibrant conference, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Um, so just quickly, as the association moves forward, um, planning, among other things, to revamp the website, um, I just hope that everyone here will send uh, Michael Brentnell and me any ideas on how we can work together to make this website something that works for every single person in the association. Um, so that's just, just a thought, emails, and so forth. I've been asked to uh, talk for 10 to 15 minutes um, on my personal take on the theme of this conference, preparing students for success, and also uh, to maybe mention something from my own experience of, of teaching. So um, 
that's a daunting because a success has obviously got a lot of meanings and I hope over the course of the next couple of days to hear more from you about what it means uh, to you. Um, we probably all believe, and, and I certainly believe, um, but uh, that we're preparing for student, students for success in dealing with the world when we teach them to think more clearly, make them able to process and understand ideas, complex ideas better. Um, and I also think, you know, I know there's lots of disciplinary differences among you, but I, I think that um, we're preparing them for success in dealing with the world when we give them a lot of good specific tools. The ability to call up the World Values Survey on the web and do a cross-tab and find out um, what the relationship is between gender and, and attitude in some country that they, someone's never even uh, visited. Um, to be able to, to understand and read a regression, to be able to um, read history critically, to be able to recognize an open access good, that's my term for a, what economists call a non-excludable good, an, an open access good where if you, put it, if you create it, like roads or defense, anybody can use it without paying it, and that what that kind of good does creates a collective action problem. Um, and that collective action problem probably needs coercion to, might well need coercion to solve it. And so you probably need, you're going to do better if you have legitimate coercion. So those kinds of ideas, you know, that comes from rational choice, so maybe some people won't like it. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I think those ideas are, are pretty important. Those tools are pretty important to give our, our students in my own field of political theory, um, what I've tried to do is to give my students a sense of the contradictions among the ideals that have come to us and that we believe so firmly in uh, that are important in democracy, uh, liberty, equality, and so forth, and how not to be thrown off by the, some of those contradictions, but to take them as practical challenges and intellectual challenges and hold to the ideals, for example, the common good. Uh, we all know that there is no such thing as a perfect common good. So does that mean you throw the concept out the way Schumpeter would have us do? No, you don't. You, you, you get more subtle about it, and you, you begin to understand the problems with the concept, but you, that doesn't undermine uh, your understanding of it as a regulative ideal, an ideal to aim at. Um, but at any rate, so those are the kinds of things I've tried to uh, teach, and, and so that's what success um, means to me. And it is, it's around that theme, having a goal and passing on some tools, that I've had my lowest points in teaching and my highest points. And I thought I'd tell you about those, uh, since Kim said, why don't you throw in a few anecdotes about teaching. So I'll tell you, the worst point was about 20 years ago um, when I had a significant in incident of plagiarism in my class. Now, we've all had, I'm sure, many incidents of plagiarism. But this one had a really bad effect on me, and I thought I'd tell you why. I was teaching a class that I loved. It was called Concepts in Democratic Theory. And the students had two papers to do, one early in the, early in the quarter and one later. And the first one was, well, what would, what would your ideal of liberty be in your ideal society? Three pages. <laughs> Told people it was like a haiku that they had to, you know, that they had to, you know, really condense. And I worked with people on those papers and, and um, so then later in the quarter there was one, um, uh, after we talked, I talked uh, about the quality, it was um, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Would that be your, the distributive criterion in your ideal society? And if not, what would be? And you got seven pages to do that. And it, it was great. I, I loved those papers. I wrote extensive comments on them. I worked with the students on them. They poured out their hearts to me. I poured out my heart to them. You know, it was a wonderful, wonderful class. And the papers were the heart of it. But um, those, that was such a neat question that I repeated it from year to year. So you can immediately see what's going to happen, which is one of the fraternities got one of the good papers. And, and so one year I got two kind of clones of that paper, rewritten and whatnot. But you could tell from the wording that it was the same progenitor. 
to get to the dean because that's what we had to do. Um, and the, one of the students got off scot free, the other one um, just got a slap on the wrist. And I, it's sort of, that was the end of that, it came at the end of that semester, so I didn't hurt my teaching that semester. But the next year, I got the worst evaluations I've ever gotten. And the reason was that instead of kind of feeling with everybody, this is this is it. We're trying to we're struggling with ideas. We're kind of we're together. We're working on this. Like I really want to hear what you say, and and I and I I'm, I want to respond to it. I was thinking, okay, which of you is going to cheat? And I and I just felt distance from people. I felt like a policeman, and I, I changed, of course, the topic, but. Those two topics were just, they weren't really topics. They were kind of like, well, what do you think? I mean, it was just, it wasn't a topic. And I couldn't think of other pa paper topics. And so I felt stymied and bad. And, and it, this isn't the story with a happy ending because I didn't ever really, my evaluations went up and I got better, better. But I never really got my, got back in the saddle on that class. Um, but I learned how important that kind of connection, that kind of sense that you're in a common endeavor is for teaching. So now my high points have been fairly recently at the Kennedy School where um, I have a class that's more than half non-American, non usually about three quarters from other countries. And again, I'm teaching democratic theory. This time I'm teaching it, you know, what you might think of as the most boring way possible, starting with Aristotle and going down to Foucault, almost all dead white males. Um, but I'm teaching it kind of as democracy is a work in progress. We've been trying to figure this stuff out since Aristotle or, or before, since hunter-gatherers really. Um, and we're in tough shape now, the world, your country, my country. And we've got to use our brains to figure out how, what to do about it. And then people write a big long paper at the end of their choosing, so it's always it's always engaged that way, and um, and so from you know the Chinese student who entrepreneur who had started his own started as a peasant and then started his own factory and had made a ton of money and was now coming to the Kennedy School because he wanted um, he wanted to his goal was to start a university um, from that person who owned his own factory and was writing on Carol Pateman's theory of worker worker control to an Indonesian activist who was writing on negotiation, um, I, I felt again that I was sort of back working with people to, to, to do what we all can, could together to, to understand the political situation and, and how to do, to do it maybe a little bit better. Um, so I think, it depends what you mean by success, um, but I think I'm, helping prepare those students for success. Success in understanding the world around them and success maybe in even changing uh, the world to which they'll return. Um, and when I spoke about the student paper on negotiation, uh, I'm gonna segue now into uh, the task force that I have for this year as president of the association, um, which is a task force on negotiating to agreement. And I see that task force in a way, the way I see my class and I see my own life, as a group of people trying to figure out something that we haven't figured out very well. So my first book, Beyond Adversary Democracy, was on town meetings and on a new left participatory democracy, showing that we didn't even know how to do town meetings very well. And we didn't know how to do participatory democracies very well, which I knew already. That's why I actually did the work for that book. Um, trying to trying to kind of help a little. There's a sort of self-help manual in there and an ERA book. Again, trying to sort of see what are the kind of screw-ups that, that social movements get themselves into. The ERA movement was one of the very, very best. If a bad, some bad drug dynamics happen there, they're going to happen across the board. So what can we learn from how to do social movements better, how to listen to one another better? So this negotiation task force is asking um, the people in the working groups, and I hope and I'm hoping that over that maybe at the receptions and stuff, people here will come up to me with some ideas about how to go forward. Because you've been teaching a lot of you 
things that involve simulations and that in one way or another touch on negotiation. Um, the idea is politics is a lot negotiation. In fact, Tom Edsel said at the end of the EU, uh, in the U.S. group, politics is negotiation. It's an exaggeration, but um, but polit but negotiation is done behind closed doors. So we don't study it as carefully as we study elections and local votes and so forth. Um, we've got good rational choice modeling on some negotiations. Um, we have good IR work on conflict resolution. We have courses on the U.S. Congress that, that make negotiations central. But we don't know, for example, what institutions facilitate good negotiation. The people who teach negotiation in business schools and law schools and policy schools all over the country teach you how to be a good negotiator as an individual. They're not political scientists, so they're not thinking institutionally. They're not thinking how do you create structures, how do you create institutions that make it more likely that you're going to have a good negotiation. So for example, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, when if you can if you can create a couple of places that generate quote unquote facts, and I'm not a I'm not but that are relatively agreed on relatively agreed on, then you're past a major first step in negotiation, which is that people often simply don't agree on the fact, quote unquote facts. Um, so that would be a simple uh, institution. But there are other institutions that involve private spaces that we, a lot of which we've eliminated in the name of transparency. Um, Long-term incumbencies, which we're against for other reasons. They're, they're, there, there are institutions that we should be thinking about if we're thinking about what makes negotiate good negotiation. So I'm hoping that you all will take that question to heart, namely, what do you all know about what makes good negotiation? And maybe send me an email or, or come up to me at a, at a, you know, at a reception or something and pass that, pass that on uh, to me. Because um, I have the privilege tomorrow of commenting on a terrific paper on the simulations track by David Niven that shows students increasing in their capacity for complex thinking after playing the roles of members of Congress in the simulation that includes the negotiation. Um, so that's, that's something I want to put on your agenda, uh, your intellectual agenda going forward. Uh, what can we tell the world? about how to do good negotiations. And success with our students, I'll just conclude, conclude to say that I think it's, it's just a repeat of what I've said before. If we can help them become more informed, help them process more complex thought, be better equipped with the tools of analysis that will let them make good choices as citizens and political actors, then I think success will be if they too become a force for good in this hugely difficult project that our profession has set itself to help in, this hugely difficult project of us human beings figuring out how to govern ourselves justly and well. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you for those very um, important comments and encouraging us to think about what it takes to get to negotiations. But also, thank you for sharing with us your experiences, the good and the bad, um, with regard to teaching. Um, and as Jenny mentioned, um, she will be here throughout at the meeting. She is a track participant in the simulations track. I hear the other moderators are very jealous that Jenny's not in their track. Um, but we're just happy to have her here and we also have other um, APSA council members here. If you are on the APSA council, would you mind standing so we can acknowledge that you're here? Okay, great. So Carlos Huerta, Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado. Thank you. So um, at this point, I'd like to ask the roundtable 
participants to please come forward. And as they're doing that and they're taking their seats, um, I'd like to do something very quickly that we usually do. Um, I know every year, every semester, we as teachers and scholars um, in the classroom, we always ask our students to do a little icebreaker. Um, so if you guys remember this from last year, um, I'm going to ask you to do an icebreaker. So we're kind of going to turn the tables on you a little bit. What we usually do is along the themes of the conference, um, we would ask you to stand up, to stretch, but while you're doing that, to share with your neighbor something that you would like to teach them or, or have them teach you something or try to learn something from someone else. So either where you're from, how many languages you speak, what courses you teach, what's the craziest thing that's, that's happened to you in your political science cl uh, classroom. So it's a way for you to kind of share, but also, um, or maybe not that. Um, but please do so. I'll give you a couple minutes. The round table is going to come up, and we will reconvene in about three minutes. Okay. Stand up, stretch, share. Go ahead. <laughs> 